So hello and welcome to the panel on identity and reputation, which is organized by the Smart Contract Research Forum, or SCURF, as part of the Smart Contract Summit that's happening this year. I'm Eugene Leventhal, the operations lead at SCURF, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's panel, which is going to be exploring the question of what role distributed ledger technology can play in reducing wealth inequality and in terms of building stronger communities. We're specifically going to be getting into the role that identity and reputation play in this context. But without further ado, let me introduce our panelists uh, Our panelists today, uh, and then we'll get to each panelist presenting briefly, and then we'll jump into a moderated discussion. So first off, uh, I just want to say thank you to our two panelists today, Jamil Tarun and Professor Seth Kopen-Goldstein. Thanks for having us. Hi, thanks. So let me just start off with some quick bios and then we'll get into the presentations. So Jamil is an entrepreneur, uh, artist, engineer, and part-time academic. He has 20 plus years in the background of digital currencies and gaming. Within an early stage startup, his team has developed a 3D virtual world and a real world compatible currency with venture capital from Silicon Valley on a project he had worked on between 2008 and 2014. Since 2018, uh, Jamil is the co-founder of a startup inspired by a 40-year-old decentralized credit creation instrument used in Turkey that we'll hear more about today. He is also teaching a course on blockchains at Istanbul's prestigious uh, Bogaza, Bogazici University. Yeah. Was it? Bogazici. It was... Bogazici, yeah, it's a bit difficult, man. <laughs> hopefully I wasn't too far off, and at least uh, hopefully people will recognize the name. Yes, thank you. So thanks for joining, Jamil. And uh, we also have Professor uh, Seth Copen-Goldstein, who has been a faculty member in the Department of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University since 1997. He received his PhD in computer science at UC Berkeley and his BS from Princeton University. Seth's main research agenda focuses broadly on ensembles. That's large collections of interacting agents where he has explored topics such as reconfigurable computing, how ensembles of molecules could be used to create circuits and, pro and programmable matter, just to name a few. Most pertinent for today's discussion, Seth has moved his focus to ensembles of people and he's investigating the interaction of technology, work and money since returning from his most recent startup. In particular, Seth is interested in understanding, quantitatively, the impact of technological progress on the labor market and innovation. He's developing social technology and alternative monetary systems that can reduce poverty and opportunity inequality, as well as support innovation and creativity in a post-labor economy. Seth's main effort is ZOOS, uh, which is a financial inclusion tool that, that combines lending and payment on a single distributed ledger-based system. Zuz builds on local trust to increase access to capital and creates a functioning bottom-up community currency from each individually issued token or Zuz. And so uh, now let me go ahead and pass it off to Jamil, who will provide a presentation on Defterhani and his project. Thank you. Um, so I'm sharing the screen now. Yes. Okay. Um, all right, um, my presentation today, uh, I will try to be brief in five, six minutes, is about trust-based credit system on blockchain that is being used in Turkey for more than 40 years. Um, uh, in, in, as a beginning, I must tell uh, initially that money version 1.0 was not uh, this one, Lydia's gold uh, lion coins uh, as initially uh, thought, uh, which were, uh, you know, uh, coined uh, around 500 BC, also in Turkey, uh, today's Turkey, uh, what we call Sardis. But rather, the or original money version 1.0 was actually the accounting and uh, credit certificates that were used in tablet form uh, by the Sumerians. And this is about 2,000 years before the Lydian golden coins. Another <clears throat> that certificate found in a Turkish museum, uh, sorry for the uh, this slanted picture I took with my phone. This is uh, from BC 1800, uh, and it's about a uh, debt between two uh, tradesmen. 
And it's a really interesting since uh, in my presentation, I will come uh, momentarily to a mechanism very similar to the one that has been that was recorded in those 2000 year old or, or more 2500 years old documents uh, on tablets. Uh, so let's come to blockchain. The core of disruption uh, in blockchains is, of course, a decentralized uh, nature of the, the, uh, the creation of a new type of money. Uh, and for example, with Bitcoin, um, uh, it is def described as uh, a, a trustless uh, system, trustless network uh, of uh, people and uh, nodes. And each user has a copy of the ledger and participates in configuring, uh, confirming transactions independently. And I, I try to show it on the right-hand side. This is the topology of uh, Satoshi's creation called Bitcoin. However, in the actual uh, world, uh, users uh, are not anonymous to uh, neighboring nodes and each node has a trust network of nodes in the real uh, world cases of uh, internet. And in our case, in, in the case that I'll just describe in a moment, uh, we also need to have a trust uh, between persons on the network. Um, one last uh, thing to show is uh, uh, how do the banks earn their money today? Uh, bank, banks earn 10% of their income from remittance or EFT transfer and, and, or other forms of money. Uh, but they earn majority of their income from loans, which, is, which are credits, extended credit to businesses and people, and they charge fees and interest on them. However, the, today's cryptos are all about that 10%, which is mostly about moving money. However, the other 90%, which is the credit side, is not addressed at all. Uh, well, there is DeFi, but of course, DeFi is not the same type of credit creation that we see in, in the uh, real world situation today. So Bitcoin is basically about transactions and uh, cryptocurrency transfer on insecure networks. Now it, let's come to this interesting um, Wadeli check example, which is a mechanism that has been used for more than 40 years in, in uh, modern Turkey. And uh, this is based on uh, bank checks uh, the, the papers, the checks that are created, uh, that are given to tradespeople and SMEs, small and medium-sized corporations by the banks. And however, they are used in, in a diff completely different uh, form. Uh, it's not used like the checks in the Western world. Uh, so here in Turkey, uh, somebody, when uh, he or she gives a check to the second party, uh, it, it is 100% of the times with a future date, usually six months or eight months ahead of the day that uh, the, sign, the check is signed. And so after this point, uh, this uh, paper acts like a payment uh, method and changes hands uh, usually 10, 15 times, uh, but the average is five. And with this interesting mechanism, people essentially create their own money in terms of future credit. And this is totally and completely based on trust. So people trusting each other, uh, usually in pairs, uh, essentially in pairs. And then for instance, in this example, the first person Ali uh, gives the check uh, to Bora, second person, and Bora has to trust Ali, otherwise it won't happen. So these two people, the two uh, tradesmen or uh, SME owners, in this case, uh, they create money out of their own uh, uh, credibility, essentially Ali's credibility. Then Bora can pass this to Jaren uh, by a signature on the backside of the paper. And th the trust direction is from right to left. And also note that here, Jaren, the third person, doesn't know Ali, do does not need to know Ali, and Demir does not need to uh, no Bora. So this is kind of like a, uh, by, it works uh, between two people. And for the last slide, I want to give you the size of this economy in modern Turkey. I have the 2018 data. And in that year, Turkish SMEs had issues, issued 12, 
21 million Wadele checks with a total face value of 940, almost 1 trillion Turkish lira. And this was two, $200 billion in 2018 uh, numbers. And average velocity, that is the number of hands of each check, was five. So the total economy based on people's reputation, uh, reputation-based credit system was about one trillion US dollar in 2018. Uh, so <clears throat> this is interesting example I want to uh, put uh, to the interest of uh, researchers and uh, blockchain engineers all over the world. Uh, here, commerce depends on reputation and reputation-based cre created creation ability, and that's not, nothing else. So we have a new, uh, and, and my startup is uh, actually about blockchain-based uh, uh, mechanism exactly like this one, and we're, we're kind of copying this real-world example on smart contracts uh, that we plan to uh, work on Ethereum. So this is about it, and I, I hope uh, it, it is uh, useful as a first understanding. Thanks. <clears throat> Great. Thanks so much for presenting, Jamil. And I'll pass it off now to Seth so he can talk a little bit about his project before we get into the moderated discussion. Thank you, Eugene, and thank you, Jamil. So uh, the project I want to talk about today is called Zoos, and uh, basically... Um, this is a system to build on local trust to do uh, very similar to what Jamil was talking about, and that is use uh, credit or lending and payment on a single platform. Um, <clears throat> so Bob Hope uh, very humorously talked about how a bank is a place to get money if you don't need it. But in the real world, this is actually a serious problem, at least in the United States. Uh, Main Street banks are failing small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, they're lending less and less to these businesses over time. And 85% of small and medium-sized businesses report needing more capital to grow is the essential problem. The reason for this is that the cost of a loan of $10,000 or $10 million is essentially the same to the bank. And the relationships or reputation that business owners had with their banks is sort of disappearing as community banks, which have been the historical lender, uh, are closing uh, at a rapid rate. Not only that, um, if you're a woman owned or minority owned small or medium sized business, you get a significantly less than your fair share of the amount of money loaned. So that's one part of the problem that uh, businesses uh, can't get access to capital to grow. The other part of the problem is, is that communities themselves are being hurt by the sort of globalization of e-commerce and such. If you spend $100 in your local community at a locally owned store, the community keeps 68 of those dollars. And that makes for healthy communities. If you spend that same $100 at a big box store or at an online mega store like Amazon, the community keeps only a dollar. So we want to tackle both the problem of access to capital and local liquidity in a community. So our solution is based on the fact that reputation that you have in your community is something that you can turn into capital. It's a two-sided solution where on the same platform, we're both lending money and using the platform, the, essentially the loans to be able to pay for goods and services. In some sense, this is uh, the 90% of the pie integrated with the 10% of the pie that Jamil was talking about. So merchants can raise money from the community by putting together like a, what you could think of it as like a crowdfunding platform uh, campaign. And that campaign runs on the website. So it's also a marketing activity. And Individuals that care about that merchant that want to support it can come and buy their zoos. Essentially think of it as a digital uh, gift card or a, a loan uh, instrument. And so they buy this gift digital gift card from the merchant and it ends up in their wallet. The merchant gets some cash. That's the capital they're raising. And then the consumers 
um, A, might get maybe these digital gift cards pay an interest rate. So there's a little bit of uh, self-interest involved here. Uh, they get to support the business and essentially inject capital into their community, uh, which is good for uh, supporting the entire community. And of course, this is all easy to use because of the digital ledger technology and the wallet application that runs on top of it. So how does this work? Let's say Blake's Bakery wants to raise some money. So Amari uh, is a big fan of Blake's Bakery. Uh, she loves uh, Blake's cupcakes or whatever. Uh, and so she will buy some Blake's Bakery Zoos uh, so in, in exchange for uh, some local currency. Now, Amar, uh, Blake has, uh, let's say, $20 worth of uh, US dollars that uh, Amari gave him. And uh, Amari now has $20 worth of Blake's Bakery Zoos. Now, she can, of course, use that to buy a cup of coffee or something at a later date. Um, but because this is all on a digital ledger and everybody can see the transactions, and this is where sort of identity and reputation come in, uh, Amari can also potentially spend her Blake's Bakery Zoos at Dakota's hardware store. This is the equivalent of uh, the uh, Videli checks uh, where someone is essentially signing the back and giving it to somebody else. So now the question is, is why would Dakota take Blake's Bakery Zoos? Well, we're all part of a community. This is a, you know, essentially think of it as a social graph where, uh, you know, Charlie Salon is doing business with Blake's Bakery Zoos, who's doing business with Dakota's Hardware. And once one person is willing to accept someone else's zoos, then what happens is that instrument becomes liquid. And it's exactly like what uh, Jamil was talking about where we get this fractional banking, injecting more capital into this local economy. So think about it. Blake's Bakery got $20 of, of uh, United States currency and Dakota got $20 worth of Blake's Bakery Zoos. And so now the community has $40 worth of value. Because of this, the communities grow stronger. The trust in the community grows and there is a, not just a correlation, but causation uh, between increased trust and increased wealth. And so you get this sort of digital small town feel because all of these individual pairwise transactions are recorded on the ledger and everyone can see that, for example, Blake's Bakery Zoos are flowing liquidly in the community. And we get increased money or value in the community itself. The Zoos protocol runs on a uh, distributed ledger. It's sort of agnostic about that. Uh, and of course, there's a wallet to keep track of everything. And, and, and in the long run, because all of these transactions are happening on the ledger, you can imagine mining the ledger to create sort of reputation metrics that are potentially correlated with default risk to make it possible for these small businesses to access large amounts of capital from the sort of mainstream banking community because all of a sudden now they have a quantifiable metric they can use to uh, make a loan. And so I'll leave it there. And uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to take them uh, at uh, info at zooslab.com. Thank you. Great. Thank you both for presenting. And we'll make sure to, to include links and easy ways for people to learn more and follow up uh, in, in the forum posts that we create around this. And I'll plug that at the end. But I just wanted to, to start by kind of asking you both a question relating to something that uh, was alluded to in both of your presentations, the, the role that trust plays in these kind of systems. And I think it's an interesting question to start off with in terms of how you build trust in these systems, whether it's people trusting the system itself or people trusting each other to want to use such a system. So um, yeah, would either, either one of you mind jumping in on that one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Seth, do you want to go first? Uh, uh, sure. Okay. <laughs> Although I think that you have um, a, you know, a, a easier time of answering this question, given the social foundation of what's happening with these future dated checks in Turkey. Uh, so there, there's sort of a sociological uh, foundation for building this trust. I think that mm -hmm. um, 
you know, building trust in the system, well, that happens over time. Uh, you know, you can release code based, you know, your code from your ledger, everyone can read the ledger, but of course there has to be some basic trust in the system. But on top of that, there has to be trust of each other. And, you know, the first question that people ask me a lot is, well, what happens if Blake's Bakery defaults? What happens to my zoos that I own? And, you know, that is an important question and it is a loan in that sense. And that's why knowing, sort of being transparent and actually having the real world identity of the issuers of zoos is absolutely essential. And I know this runs counter to people's intuition about what distributed ledger technology is about. I mean, people think about blockchain and anonymity, but in the end, you know, cryptographically secure, secure signatures and identities are what are gonna make this work. And there are mechanisms you can build into the system that allow people to, for instance, confirm that the zoos they're selling are related to their business. And I think it's a matter of seeing the transactions unroll over time and you get more and more trust. Excellent. Um, I will give an example from uh, for this question uh, at, that I heard from my uncle, late uncle, who was uh, in Bursa's Covered Bazaar. Uh, he, he worked as trusted escrow person uh, for these kind of transactions. So uh, imagine a city the size of like a, uh, about half million. It's called Bursa and it has a covered bazaar the year 1950. And two person, uh, two tradesmen, they buy silk uh, clothing or other silk uh, textiles from one to the other. Uh, and the, one of the tradesmen says, I will pay you 10,000 liras six months ahead. And they shake hands. And this happens in front of my uncle, who is the escrow person, uh, assigned person for this transaction. And there is no paper uh, involved in this situation. Just trust the names, you know, the reputation in a small community of tradesmen. It's very important to actually follow your word and, uh, you know, uh, or honor your word uh, and always pay in time to the other person. And the, th the third person, my uncle being the escrow person, actually has a small notebook and takes notes of these transactions uh, that takes part in front of him like a kind of like a referee and this when things get went bigger and and many other um, cities involved uh, necessitated another kind of escrow and in that case they used later on in 1980s the bank checks as a kind of like an escrow uh, mechanism rather than human beings uh, so bank checks were used for like, a, like an escrow mechanism for the reputation carrier between cities. Uh, but still, you must understand that this is a reputation-based currency, reputation-based or trust-based uh, transaction, completely trust-based transaction between uh, trading people. And this goes back to many, many thousand years. And what people did with Wadili checks in paper was just copy this, uh, you know, analog mechanism and put it on another paper or, or oral mechanism and they put it on paper. And now what we try to make uh, is to put it on, a, you know, trusted decentralized ledger and not break the, the mechanism because it is decentralized. There is no central bank. There is no bank, etc. cetera. So uh, I hope I can give you this as, as Seth said, it's a soci sociological, uh, long-term built trust between humans in a community. But, but I, I think just, just to add to that for a second, I think that you know, the, the history of our civilization is one of people coming together to do things together. And reputation, even if it wasn't quantifiable, has always been a part of how we do our, how we interact. And so yes. the question is, is can we sort of create a little bit more incentive to build up that reputation? And I think that's what the transparency mm. of the ledger provides here, uh, particularly yes, very, we, we very true. in bigger and bigger communities. Very true. Uh, because it was in time, it was uh, 
abused, you know, by people who used uh, uh, the non-transparent uh, nature of the bigger mechanism. And as Seth says, I think we have to rebuild uh, this reputation and trust the mechanism using blockchains. And so I want to dig into something that was alluded to in both of your answers in terms of the role that identity plays in, in some of these systems and the idea that it needs to be a real world identity. I know you explicitly said that, Seth and Jamil, in the example you gave, I mean, your, your uncle knew those people. He knows their names, presumably where they live in the community, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So uh, a two-part question, uh, is there a specific reason you think it absolutely needs to be uh, sort of a fully disclosed identity? And the second part is, once the system is established enough, can a pseudo-anonymous entity gain enough reputation over time that it becomes okay if I want to use my online handle as opposed to Eugene Leventhal for whatever reason? So I think that uh, that is essential to make this a working system. Not every transaction everybody wants to do, uh, do they want disclosed, um, but that there are ways because we have smart contracts underlying this to get both the advantages of the real world identity so that defectors are essentially punished, which encourages uh, uh, trusting the system and, and uh, you know, following the system and allowing people to be, uh, to have some of the um, attributes of anonymous transactions. So for instance, in zoos, uh, you have a real world identity and then people know who you are, but you can have as many identities as you want. Now, clearly an identity with no transactions behind it has no reputation by definition, but uh, there is a, a smart contract that we have where essentially one user will say, I trust another user's currency, another user's zoos. And then what they're saying is, is I will guarantee to back that up. So mm -hmm. you can imagine that someone says, you know what, I wanna do the following transactions anonymously. So I'm gonna create this new identity and I'm gonna to go to a service that I pay to trust my currency. And so now people know this is an anonymous identity, but it's trusted by a third party. So in this sense, I think we see that there's some trade-off here between the amount of, of uh, sort of anonymity you want to have and, and some cost to that anonymity, which I think does mirror many real world transactions. So it's possible using smart contracts to get that anonymity you want and yet still have sort of a reputation-based system. Yes, um, a very similar answer. Uh, I think I can give, uh, I, I'm not going to add anything new to what Seth said, but as he said, there is a, you know, on a top layer, there is a reputation based larger transaction size flow of uh, credit. And on, on the bottom, there is another layer of anonymous, smaller transactions possible because of the first layers, uh, trust and, and confidentiality. So maybe users of the, the first layer can say, okay, this amount, I, I secure it with my own trust. So other people can use my trust and transact uh, my, my created credit in the next three months, uh, but they can be anonymous. I think we need to this anonymity. It's very important for society to function because a lot of transactions we make as humans, we don't want to uh, be uh, some... I'm, I'm hearing my voice. Okay. We don't want to be, uh, you know, always the, the person that uh, we are. Sometimes we want to hide our uh, personality. And this is very normal and very human. Great. Yeah. And I guess to, to follow up there. So, I mean, to with a specific question with both of you as the way you're thinking of your systems, if I wanted to register today, before, and I do also want to zoom into the idea of sort of a trust as a service provider within these systems, but before getting there, if I wanted to register with either one of your systems once they're deployed and how you're envisioning the initial version, do I have to do that with a driver's license or a passport? Or what is the actual specific mechanism that I as an individual would use to prove my identity? So uh, in our system, we sort of differentiate between the people who are 
uh, creating zoos to like the merchants who are like Blake's Bakery, who are selling zoos as a way to raise some capital and the users of the system like Amari who are buying those zoos and trading them. And so someone like uh, Blake has to uh, you know, create a campaign which they verify and they're gonna need, if they want people to trust it, in other words, there's no requirement, but if they want people to trust it, they're gonna put their like, you know, incorporation documents or photos of their shop or whatever. And then there's a protocol to verify that. Amari, on the other hand, she just needs to supply an email address or a phone number. Um, and uh, she gets less reputation in some sense, but she's not staking any zoos. So that, that's okay. In our case, in our case, we, uh, day, day one, this time zero in initially, we don't have reputation in our hands uh, recorded in the system, but eventually in time, okay, we will have many users with uh, recorded transactions, then there will be a built reputation. So in the first instance, in order to start the project, we will need to have an already uh, registered uh, system of identities. So we, we, we will trust in the beginning uh, some third party uh, uh, trust builders uh, services to be provided to our systems, which is not perfect, but um, I think we don't have another option until we create our own system of uh, reputation. So, and so uh, just to add to that for a second, I think the other thing is, is that you can create verified identities that identify that the person is an individual and the same individual without actually revealing the data that they have. So Correct. let's say they Correct. do provide a photo of their driver's license or their social security number. That gets then get encrypted as part of a hash for that user ID. And now we know that this is a real world person with that data, but not who it is. So Correct. it's up to them to decide how much they want to disclose. And also additionally, Seth, when even that uh, concealed identity, let's say uh, uh, like a long hashed, you know, uh, address of the person, sometimes other users notice that this is the same person who did such and such transaction five days ago. You may need additional, uh, you know, layers of uh, uh, anonymity in order to have real, uh, you know, discrete transactional space. So I think it's an open question whether or not we truly need this. I think that, there, that when we think about privacy and anonymity, we tend to conflate two things. And one is the sort of the ability to be uh, opaque and anonymous. And the other is the ability to be forgotten. And I think that those two things are actually quite separate. And, you know, the, you know, one of the problems I think that we face as a society right now is that we conflate them. And it would be nice to be able to sort of start over. But when you're in a community, when you're in a network, I don't think there are actually significant social advantages for that community for people to be opaque. So I think it, this is a you know, yet to be understood whether or not people actually need significant layers of anonymity on a system like this. Yes, I agree. And I guess to, to follow that thread a little more than, you know, taking a step back maybe to think about the general tensions between transparency and privacy, kind of how do you think through the balance between those two as you're both kind of designing these systems? Uh, good question. Um, this is, a, as, as Seth said, there is, these are two different things. And when it comes to actually uh, uh, conceal uh, the transactions themselves uh, and not necessarily conceal uh, the person uh, in, in, in his or her uh, trustability, uh, we are planning to use, are we, or the, actually we are now using zero knowledge systems uh, mathematics that is uh, to actually uh, not show the actual transactions, but uh, still keep them uh, mathematically secure so that uh, someone, somebody who is asking 
the authenticity of the transactions, uh, he or she can reveal uh, mathematic uh, proofs for these transactions. Uh, this is, you know, there is a balance between how you design the systems and how the users can understand what's going on, uh, user uh, accessibility and uh, ease, ease of use. There is always these trade-offs. And I think in the time, we will find the uh, best way to actually do uh, this according to the community's needs. So uh, I think uh, at Zoos, we're being very careful to provide the mechanisms that are necessary, but not actually determine the policy. So for example, there is nothing that prevents a user uh, from creating their own Zoos and being completely anonymous. The question is, is will anyone buy those zoos, right? So, uh, you know, maybe there are some risk takers who are willing to pay, you know, receive a tremendous amount of interest and not know if they'll ever be able to redeem it. So I think that people will, the users will make this decision and what will emerge from this process is we'll see what the cost of privacy is, whether people actually want anonymity or not, or whether or not they'll see the benefit of sort of being transparent as a huge positive for the community that creates more economic value, a tighter supply chains, and, you know, and the, the other positives that come uh, out of having this sort of uh, transparent uh, identity and, and transactions. That also just makes me think about how interesting and challenging thinking through the governance of such systems on a community level can be and how much variability do you want to give a community to really drive their own decision choice of that balance versus how much do you kind of prescribe it to say, hey, for a high probability of certainty to be able to support this trust in the first place, you need to make the, the X, Y trade-off specifically. Um, yeah, that's just a very interesting balance. And I guess, are there any other things that you would want community leaders to be thinking through specifically as they're going through this, especially if it's an initial design and they're not used to the full kind of uh, the complexity of the mechanism design around these things? Um, so I think that, you know, which policies will work for which communities are going to depend on the community. So you can imagine synthesizing uh, different kinds of financial instruments from these basic primitives of, you know, being able to issue trust lines uh, for other people's currency or being able to ensure other people's currency or setting up governance policies on the ledger that talk about one merchant, uh, you know, a, a, a series of merchants sort of pooling together. And um, if one of them defaults, the other one's picking up the slack. I mean, all of these different things come with trade-offs. And I think it's a matter of sitting down and thinking about what your community needs. What, what are the goals that are, are you're trying to achieve? Is it just raising capital? Is it trying to keep more trade local? Is it to support people in need? I mean, so those are like three really different objectives that will require, I think, different mechanisms. And it's a matter of exploring those and thinking about which mechanisms you implement to get the policy that you want. Yeah. Uh, from, from the point of view of the existing Vadeli checks, we noticed that it's a really decentralized system and it doesn't have any central authority or controlling mechanism or any any third party that is recording what's going on actually it's completely unrecorded in its uh, present form so i will suggest that they, dao uh, the centralized autonomous organization to operate and maintain this next monetary exchange system as we design it will be the best solution but of course this is uh, open to debate um, I, I don't know if set <laughs> actually uh, thinks uh, in the same line. Uh, I think nobody should own the money, although it is uh, created by individuals with their own trust as a whole, is, will not be, un, must not be owned by any central authority. That's what I think. So, so I agree that, that we're long past the time of, uh, of uh, you know, royally decreed currencies. 
Um, I do think that there is a role of, for regulatory authorities um, to help manage the system. But in the end, I, I'm on the same page as Jamil. And when I talked about like choosing the right mechanisms, I'm talking about a group of merchants coming together or a local library coming together and getting its patrons to figure out what policy they want. So it's community driven, but uh, you know, there, there is a role for government, uh, you know, particularly in protecting um, public goods and uh, trade, you know, in some sense is a public good. So, um, or at least facilitating it. And I think that the, the points you both just brought up uh, marry very nicely to some other panels that we're, we're hosting as part of the summit, as we have two specifically focused on governance and exploring DAOs. So it'll be interesting to see if we can, at least on the forum, uh, get some kind of follow-up intersectional discussion there, or maybe do some future event. But uh, just keeping an eye on time for today, that also just made me think about what kind of information is important to share across communities or within a single community and the structures for sharing that, whether it is something along the lines of policies and how, how do you let different communities know what are the policies being used and the pros and cons. I can see that quickly devolving into being information overload. Um, and a similar question, another two-parter, a similar question goes for bankruptcies. When someone fails within the system, do you just need the system to readjust or do you, for the trust building, do you need to clearly communicate these type of things? Uh, please. Um, so let's see, two parts. So the first part was sharing oh, well, more you, of policies and governance. policies in some sense. So I do think that, you know, one of the main challenges that we're facing is the, the sort of all of the flexibility here and the flexibility can lead to complexity. And I think that there probably will be, um, you know, some standard uh, you know, basic templates that work to achieve different goals. And I, I think that, you know, we're going to have to figure out what those templates are so that people can have a basic understanding of how these, this particular community put together their mechanisms. Um, and that in the end, you know, community structures are not that different and not just within a country, but across countries. And, uh, human relationships, you know, we're all humans. Um, and I think that there will be a set of sort of standard templates that will uh, become prevalent and people will pick and choose amongst those. Um, and one of those policy decisions will be how much um, uh, the decision about how much to protect the consumers, the buyers of the, the zoos. So if a merchant does default, are they made good? Who, who eats that cost? And I think some communities will experiment with, you know what, we want to fund as much entrepreneurial activity as possible and it'll be on the consumers. And others will say, you know what, we wanna protect our consumers as much as possible. So there'll be some fees that go into insurance pools, which are then redistributed back to merchants if no one fails, but otherwise are used to make consumers good. And so mm -hmm. you can do either one under zoos. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of where you stand on, you know, what, which, which of those policies you want to promote. Uh, and I have my own particular thoughts about that. Uh, but, um, but I think it'll be up to the communities to explore that for themselves. Yeah. Okay. Um, in our present form, in, our, in the present form of uh, daily checks in Turkey, uh, there is no insurance a mechanism already built in the system. So there is a default possibility. And in the past 10 years data, I have the data for past 15 years. 10 or 15 years, the data shows that the default rate was less than 4% and between 1.5 and 3.5 usually, uh, average uh, being 2.5 in the last 10 years. Uh, but still, uh, is it possible to reduce, to reduce this to much lower? Uh, nobody actually did try to solve this because insurance companies never tried to insure this uh, this kind of debt, uh, although it is used widely uh, in our country. Uh, all the insurance companies came from the West, 
and they really didn't understand what's going on in that uh, local mechanism. Uh, however, in our own version building uh, in DEF, DEF protocol, like Seth uh, set, uh, suggested, we are thinking of making a pool uh, cut from uh, uh, like 1% from every transaction and put into pool. It's like a peer, it's not an insurance, but rather it's a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, pool of financing for the debt debtors. And uh, if we know the percentage after a certain while, we can securely put the right amount into the pool rather than making a, an aggregate of, uh, or more than the necessary. And if there is more money in the pool at the end, uh, I don't know how to, uh, how to distribute it. These are all questions uh, that we have to find out in practice. But the beauty of having a ledger and the smart contracts is that you can put these things together that are easy. really frictionless, Very easy. low cost. Yeah. So you can, yeah. you know, a, yeah. a carving a tiny percentage out, much smaller than like Visa yeah. or MasterCard yeah. charges, yeah. Yeah. ends up being able to provide a huge social yeah. benefit. Also, in, in, in smart contract form set, we are we are able to divide the, the credits into much smaller denominations, uh, which is very beneficial for the trade uh, in, between smaller companies. Absolutely. And I want to make sure to transition a little bit to specifically looking to some reputation-related questions and, and uh, kind of following up on some threads that have been brought up throughout this discussion. And I think it's very interesting to think at the beginning, especially, how is reputation tracked or quantified to, to kind of get the system kicked off? Or does it start in a, we're all equally building reputation from time zero, everything before that sort of doesn't exist in the context of the system? Um, so at least with zoos, the, the, the same kind of reputation you would use to do a crowd lending campaign is the reputation you would bring to the system. So you put together a campaign the way you would on, you know, GoFundMe or Kiva or something like that. And it's your real world reputation and the people, the customers you have and the people in your community that you're going to reach out to. The reputation on the ledger, that's something that grows over time. Yeah. And exactly you know, how to quantify it, I think is still an open question. You know, we're doing research in that area. Um, I do think that we want to be careful and not include everything about every activity the person is doing, or we can fall into some dystopian kind of uh, scenario. So there's a um, you know, there's a fine line, or I don't know if it's a fine line, but I think there is a line between tracking every single thing you do in your life and your sort of fiscal uh, and commercial reputation that you're using to back these loans. Um, uh, this is also a very tough question to start uh, time zero, T zero, how to start uh, with credit uh, if people already don't have an accumulated uh, scoring in your system. Our plan is to start with AAA companies and these companies have their own uh, supply chain that goes uh, really uh, to many thousand smaller companies uh, and entities. Uh, it's, it, it, it's, it looks like it's the easiest way to start uh, for our system, but we will see. If we start with AAA companies, essentially we are sure that this company is going to honor their debt uh, when the time comes. Uh, so it, it looks like it's a, an initial uh, good way to start, but time will tell us. We don't know. Uh, it's a good way to actually find out uh, the result uh, very soon after starting the system. And especially given how complex this is, and especially from a quantification perspective, the whole idea of quantifying reputation is, is new and fraught with peril in its own right, as you, as you alluded to. What do you see as some of the potential dangers of reputation-based systems 
or of relying on someone else's kind of trust mechanisms. You know, just thinking in the example you were just mentioning, Jamil, uh, assuming those companies have a good structure to verify all of their vendors and everyone they're working with, then there aren't as many concerns. But, you know, unfortunately, the, the history of recent decades shows many companies might cut corners there and might themselves end up trusting a, uh, a party which maybe should not have been trusted. So do you see any particular dangers to either reputation-based systems in the first place, or more specifically to relying on someone else's kind of trust architecture when getting these systems built out? Uh, will I answer first, Seth? Uh, it's, I think in our case, uh, we have already a, a widely used, uh, quite big system uh, being uh, worked out or being used in the current Turkish economy also used in neighboring countries like Iran and, and Greece and Israel. Uh, so it, I think it is not a big, uh, I don't see a big risk here uh, when we uh, kind of copy or, or put a similar system on a blockchain uh, because we already have this you know, running system. And also I'm, I must tell you that all digital invoices are attached to these transactions. We have another online uh, digital invoicing system built by the government, and you can easily connect this, these two for larger transactions, not like the transactions in zoos maybe. They're essentially uh, a community uh, credit, uh, and they are uh, actually backed by actual goods uh, to be bought and or, or services in the near future. In the case of the, the Turkish version, there is always a real transaction backed by an invoice. Uh, so it's re real legal transaction we are talking about. However, when it comes down to SMEs, smaller transactions are possible. In many cases, we hear that there are no invoices involved, especially in agricultural transactions happening outside uh, in the field. So essentially half of the transactions in Turkish uh, current uh, why did a check system, about half of them are not invoiced, but that doesn't mean they are black transactions. Uh, mind you, they're real, real world business, but not necessarily backed by government invoices. That means it's not taxed. Uh, when there is no invoice, there is no tax involved. So I, I think that, um... You know, I'll again go to mechanism and policy. Uh, I think that uh, people will, if, if you provide people with the mechanisms, um, then it's up to them to pick a policy in some sense. Correct. So the, if you're a business person, you want to continue to do business. And so defecting from the system and not obeying the rules is going to have, you know, a larger penalty than the $50 or $500 or maybe even $50,000 that you scam somebody on. And so it's a matter of, uh, of, uh, of making sure the mechanisms are sound. Um, you know, on the flip side, you can imagine that in, this, in an ecosystem like this, there will be third parties that do things like insure people's transactions or their debt and you know for a fee or or do look under the covers and you know look at their business practices and and sort of add their own credit to it but again this is a distributed system that people will either pay for or not pay for so you know it's a mechanism and people will have to choose the policy i completely agree 100 percent with said and we unfortunately don't have the time to fully unpack, say, the regulatory considerations as, as you're thinking through some of the mechanism design as, as we just started touching on. But before we wrap up, I do just want to give both of you a chance to either mention any other elements of the project or, you know, just a chance to, to throw out any ideas that maybe we didn't get a chance to get to or uh, get to during this discussion. Um. I want to thank you, and it was uh, really uh, interesting for me to see uh, Professor Goldstein's example, Zeus. And it's really nice that we found a common ground between two projects. And I hope in the future, uh, you know, we will be able to build 
internationally working, globally working systems like this in, instead of a central uh, money uh, fiat currency. And as he mentioned in several times in his speech, uh, this is trading and community-based transactions are essential to human life. Uh, however, this is uh, currently is not really honored in, in such a way. So we have to build from bottom up again, uh, you know, an essentially human system uh, just by humans and for humans. Um, I want to thank you for uh, inviting both of us. It was great to meet Jamil and, and hear that uh, essentially this kind of thing has been going on for a long time. So I'm, I'm very pleased. Uh, you know, we're just going to reduce the frictions and, and, and make it easier to do. Uh, I think that the, both of these platforms not only offer people the opportunity of access to capital, which we know will help reduce wealth inequality, but, or, and increase the value, uh, you know, economic value in the community. But what they do is they encourage sort of local trading. And so, you know, going local and, and tightening up supply chains in a way that I think will also help like create circular economies, which will lead to just more sustainable economics. You know, one of the things that people complain about with capitalism is there no one prices in the externalities. And so you can pollute for free or whatever. But as these systems grow larger and become more a part of how people are trading, those externalities will hurt your reputation. They'll be priced in. And so I think this, these kinds of approaches uh, have the possibility of you know, doing a lot of positive good uh, not just for individuals, but, you know, for the world as a whole, in some sense, just to be, you know, create more environmentally sustainable kind of economies. Yeah, and I'll just say the the circular economy and the note that you're ending on is, is music to my ears personally. And uh, I'm very excited to see how both of your projects go and how uh, SCURF can generally be supportive as you're, as you're getting started. And I do just want to thank you again for taking the time to share your work and your thoughts today. Uh, just want to mention for those who do want to continue the conversation beyond the summit, please feel free to check out smartcontractresearch.org, where we're going to have a dedicated post to this panel with more information on both Jamil's and Seth's work, how to get in touch with them, how you can learn more about their projects, potentially get involved, and generally some more broad information on the topic so we can dig into some of the uh, more challenging and open questions around these kind of community-based uh, currencies. So yeah, thanks again, and enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank, thank you. you. I look forward to the future conversation. Me too. Thank you.